Yeah, I'm looking at this now and I'm thinking like, you know, systemic level, you know, that's doesn't happen many times. You fall in love, doesn't happen many times in your life. Then you got the institutional level is kind of like you start chatting somebody up in a bar or something. And then the situational level is knocking one out to Pornhub. This is what we're talking about here. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we meant by it. Okay, okay. Tom, okay. Okay, yeah. Tom. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of our Understanding Class by Eric Olin Wright Reading Group Series. Today we have a panel of crazy hounds jumping at the analytical Marxist bit. To aid us along our merry way, I've actually prepared a bunch of Google Slides to make sure we manage to complete this series in a finite time. The links to the slides are, of course, contained in the show notes. Today, it's Friday the 7th of May 2021, and I am your host, Tom O'Brien. This week I have the new patron, Choice Fantastic, to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes, hanging out with us over on the Emancipation Network Discord server, or joining in the new patrons-only Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution Reading Group series, why not head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar? These commie dollars help prevent my children from growing up stunted by rickets. Okay, let's hit it. Hello and welcome to the very first episode edition, our live stream of our new reading group called uh, Understanding Class, where we cover Eric Olwyn Wright's Understanding Class by Eric Olwyn Wright. Uh, Let's see, we're exactly one hour late starting, so I think that's us starting exactly on time. Today we've got a, you know, the kind of the the core crew all the way from, let's go to Derek first. We don't go to Derek first normally, all the way from Uta, Uta. Derek, how's it going? I'm okay. Got got stuck yesterday um, by the uh, turn frog's gay needle. And what are they saying about the COVID vaccine these days? The Bill Gates microchip. Yeah, I got microchips. It does kind of sting. So um, there's that. Those are nanites. Uh, I think maybe I feel a little bit, you know. Do they inject uh, it straight into your ear? Is that where they put it? Oh, no. Like, straight into my arm, man. Oh. I feel strong. No, I don't feel stronger. So we have that, and uh, I'm getting over a mild case of leprosy. Um, and that's only kind of a joke. So Social leprosy, though. Social leprosy. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> then all the way from the mangroves, Esri, how's it going? Yeah, here in humid, dank Arizona, here out in the savannah. Um, nah, it's, it's pretty good. Actually, things are fucking great, honestly. Like, things going on in my personal life, my educational life, or whatever. And we're reading an analytical Marxist text. What could be better? God damn you. God damn you, God. God damn you to every one of my patrons <laughs> for making me read this godforsaken fucking book. Let me just say that. You're going to understand class whether you want to or not. I know. It it should be called Brow Beaten by Class. That's what this reading group uh, should be called. Okay. Then uh, next, all the way from uh, Canada, we've got the main man himself, Kyle the Style Thompson. (laughs) I'm I'm styling up here. Uh, Yeah, things are, uh, well, they've been better. They've been worse. uh, But hey, you know, We're carrying it on. And honestly, I think this book is a rock of straightforward, honest prose that I can just cling on to at this point in my life. So, you know. Oh, no. Don't don't get to the end. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I was looking at that and I was like, "Ah." yeah, it's not not perfect, but uh... It makes a good Bible because there's a part that you just can't agree with. That's essential in every Bible is that there's just a whole chunk that you absolutely reject. I was about to say, like, I, when I read this book the first time after I did it, I did an interview with Eric Owen Wright that we lost. Unfortunately, Amog and I did it. And um, I wish I released it, although I don't think it would have made him look super great because when he explained it to me verbally, 
I didn't understand what he was talking about. And then I read the book and I was like, that makes way more sense than what you told me in the interview. But um, I was with the book. I was with the book. And then you hit that last chapter. And then I like threw the book across the room and cursed Esri's name. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, Esri's old name. Why? <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Well, this is um, the problems with the analytical Marxist, right? <clears throat> Methodological nationalism, sort of political conservatism, and basically rejecting most of what Marx said about economics. I was about to say, like, you don't have it as bad with Wright. Wright does still accept, like, he tries to figure out another yes. way to do most of Marx's stuff, but he does still accept most of it. But you read someone like Romer, and you're like, wow, how do you even call yourself a Marxist? Like, I think there are like neoliberals who are more Marxist than you, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eric Olin Wright has a sort of interesting trajectory in his career where economically, I guess you can say it's a U-shaped curve, right? Where um, he starts off being a in public labor theory of value supporter going through the literature as, and you know, as a, as a sociologist going through the literature and trying to, do an honest defense of the labor theory of value as it stood in, you know, 1979, then gives up the ghost. And it's like, this makes no fucking sense. This is all garbage in a way. And then f following John Romer um, develops a view of exploitation that does dovetail with some of the neoclassical stuff. And this is through Romer and that uh, it's distributional, you know, it's a form of like distributional exploitation, which is one way that you could talk about like things in the Soviet Union or something, but it kind of does violence to the basic idea of what Marxian exploitation is. Um, and then towards the end of his career, Eric Olin Wright creates a sociological criteria for exploitation that is much more based on production. And it just ends up being a way better abstraction of what exploitation is than in John Romer's work. Well, this is going to come up in this preface in the first chapter, but is this where the uh, where he he changes his distinctions from exploitation one, exploitation two, exploitation three, to exploitation, dominion, and oppression, which he separates out? Yeah, I, I don't I don't remember because that. In his early class Wait. books, he had he has like eight different kinds of exploitation, some of which aren't, frankly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I I think that's. I think it's likely what happens. I, honestly, I, I don't really read a lot of his earlier stuff, which is a shame because that's where all the empirical stuff is. But I just think that the his late stuff is much more like a rudite. And also kind of if you change up the variables, you can have a pro-revolutionary worldview. <laughs> you know, not by the way that Wright expects things to go. But based on the model and then how you know deep in your heart things are going. <laughs> but I also um, like this book, unlike some of his other books on class, he doesn't try to come up with like, frankly, pseudo parsimonious tables. Oh, yeah. That uh, only work because they're balanced. But you feel like he's making categories up to make the table work. I mean, ser I'm, I'm ser somewhat serious. Well, about no, that. no, no. That is literally what he's doing. Like, that's not um, that's not deflationary. He's literally trying to fill out the categories. You know, that's what you end up getting with a thorough, like, truth table Marxism. God damn it. I, I've just been um, I've just been editing that truth table session. I made yourself and Kyle sit in at the end of the brew mayor for two hours. <laughs> literally. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'm you your should, pain, Derek. You, you should have seen, or you should have heard the timbre of Tom's voice when I said that, you know, Technically, in Boolean logic, true to false is um, is the only way that a if-then statement could be false. So all these other variations are true. And he, he, I think if he wasn't an ocean away, he would have tried to strangle me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still have plans. I still have plans. <laughs> Get me that yeah. goddamn, get me that vaccine. Okay, so in preparation <laughs> for today, so to make sure that we actually... You know, we we did an awful lot of. Um, I think this book is very dense, so that if if we don't kind of do, if I don't do some preparation, we will get stuck in the weeds for an awful long time. So instead of reading like chapters, which we can do, if there are notes, if there are particular bits anybody wants to read, we can 
we can read them. I've broken it down where I've basically, for each of the topics, I've just kind of uh, made a lovely PowerPoint presentation. Uh, not, I hate PowerPoint presentations, but I think it might aid us in going through um, this in a finite time. So we just have a couple of slides here in the preface, and then uh, we get into the first chapter. So the preface is quite dense. Um, so let, let's have a look. You've got three main agendas here. Let me just read them out for people and let's see and let people go with them in whatever way they want. So the book, he says there are three agendas. One is to interrogate approaches to class analysis across theoretical traditions. OK, two, to develop general frameworks of class analysis that can help integrate the insights of these different theoretical traditions. And three, analyze the problem of class conflict and class compromise in contemporary capitalism. We're going to see more of this in the first chapter where he gets into looking at these different uh, traditions. Um, anything anybody has to say on the general approach he's going to undertake in the book? I think that it was pretty vital for number one so that people understand that we have to have a nominalism with the word class. Like for when people talk about class in like a, a Weberian sense or in a liberal distributionist sense or whatever, it's not that they're wrong. It's that they're talking about something completely different. And we also do need to overlay those things when we talk about class analysis. And that's to me a very serious flaw because the way Marxists play with with working class and proletariat, it is everyone and no one. It is in itself and it is either politically construed or sociologically construed or neither or both. And while there are elements to that ambiguity in Marx himself, that doesn't help anyone like figure out who, who or what the hell we're talking about. And a lot of demagogues, frankly, use the fact that there is cognitive ambiguity in the way we use class to manipulate people. And um, I think sometimes the incoherence in the way we talk about class is built in and um, exploited hard. Yeah. Um, whenever you get into analytical Marxism, you'll inevitably get into a dialectics versus analytics death spiral where you you know can easily lose the virtuous qualities of both. But um, dialectic is like, at least, you know, classically speaking, it kind of emerges from a good faith conversation and, you know, trying to like build up a definition out of a back and forth. If you have a conversation that's fundamentally rigged and bad, you have to kind of bolster your defenses. And one of the best things you can do for yourself is to nail down what a term means so that you can track how far the goalposts are being moved. So yeah, it's not so much that, you know, any, everything that was ever called dialectics is wrong and bad, but that, hey, if you want like a good way to manipulate people, one of the best things you could do is constant equivocation. So like, if you're trying not to be manipulated for some reason, trying to nail these things down for yourself is, is a good, it's a good idea. And, and also like, when you think about what a classless society is, what, you know, what do we mean? That's, I guess, the second part is that it's not only good for, you know, thinking things through and being defensive and not being manipulated. It's also good for trying to think fundamentally about the point of communism. You know, what is class and are we uncomfortable with putting certain things as class because it means we can't have our utopia? Or does that, does that make sense to call that thing class, even if it's inconvenient or... I don't know, it's a big rabbit hole thinking about what class is, but it has the positive content of like, okay, if you can isolate what class is and you're for a classless society, which would be important, you know, you're kind of figuring out in the negative what communism is. Well, I'd just like to say before Kyle butts in, I would just like to say manipulation good, <laughs> clarity bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, I, I, I was just going to say that it's nice having these terms because it helps to cut through all of the Mott and Bailey rhetoric that you could play with class by just sort of vaguely referring to these terms in whatever way is convenient, which is just all over the place when it comes to any kind of 
not just Marxist rhetoric, but oftentimes any kind of like lefty populist rhetoric. Yeah, no, I just, sorry, um, uh, Erica just uh, in the chat said, Tom, you fucking wanker. Sorry, so I was just, <laughs> I was slightly, um, you know, yeah, I, I agree with, with all of what you're saying. Like, I think the clarity that we get in how we analyze and break stuff down now, the writing style, I, I fundamentally object to. I, I find the, the writing so dry. But the analytical style of demarcating what exactly what you're meaning, like mapping on stuff like, you know, how Marx talks about a class, as is it a class as itself and a class for itself, you know, mapping them onto the way Weber talks and all that gives people a real notion about what class is, you know, whether it's relational or descriptive. I think it's it's clarifying, you know, it's definitely I think it's good. You know, I think it's good stuff. Let's try the second one. So here are the three different traditions uh, and different causal mechanisms he's going to get into when we start discussing class. The first is uh as Derek named them earlier, is like one is a stratification kind of a way of looking at class. This is the idea, like if you, I don't know, I used to work in a marketing agency and like you're, you would have these data sets you could pay from these data companies and they would tell you what class everybody was in. These are A1, B1, C2. They divide up all the districts. Every address in the country in England is set up into these kind of stratification classes. Um, so these are based like on individual attributes and conditions mainly. Then we've got our Weberian approach, which is he adds in this idea of opportunity hoarding, which we're going to get into a lot more in the next part. And then finally, we have Marxist definitions of uh, classes, which are basically based upon exploitation and domination relations in production. Anybody have anything to say about the breakdown here? Uh, yeah, just the... the the stratification approach is probably the one that is most commonly used in everyday life. Like if you are trying to navigate social situations and understand where the, the field of class forces is pushing, then typically you're going to read these stratification tags like, oh, you know, this person speaks with this accent or they're wearing these clothes or they went to this school uh, and you're going to act accordingly. So that one often takes up most of our mind uh, share. But when it comes to strategizing or thinking more deeply about social relations, the second and the third are probably more useful. But yeah, I just I just don't want to discount that like, everyone kind of thinks in the stratification sphere on a pretty regular basis in everyday life. Yeah. I think the stratification yeah. sphere is interesting though, because we attach like, um, this is something I got out of EndNotes volume four, um, how we conflate some of these things and attach images to like strata and fetishize them. And he doesn't talk about that very much in this book but i think that's interesting because it, it indicates to me that even when we're dealing in our regular life we're actually wildly flipping between these notions of class without realizing it yes and and often in a way that like i used to talk about uh when i used to talk about theology right and this this will take a second but bear with me here um I would talk about how people had incoherent notions of God and like, it wasn't that people believed or disbelieved in God because that what they were talking about was not even logically possible. And they was flipped back and forth between the notions as they spoke. And I, I feel that way about class. If like, um, unfortunately on another channel whose name I will not mention had to talk about the bellows recently and the way that there was the construction of this class that that actually doesn't meet any of these definitions, but seems to. And they would also posit completely contradictory conditions like precarity, but they're really the managers and they really run everything, but there's too many of them and they don't have jobs, but somehow they're in control of everything. And this is really a conspiracy to impact like, and that's because of the fact people can't catch that this was incoherent because some of the sociological things it's describing seems true, but it's because it's flipping between all these notions of class rapid fire. 
And it's a big problem. And Marxists do this. I mean, like, I mean, the people who say this would call themselves Marxists, but like right. Marxists, even in the the good tradition, I'm using a, having a bunch of finger quotes for people listening to this, also do this all the damn time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's someone in the chat, a Marxist in the chat that says only the last one matters. But like, even Stalin would focus on like individual attributes all the time to like ad hominem opponents and stuff. I don't know if he really cared about it, but he certainly made a show of caring about it. And, and Lenin he did too, you know. Uh, yeah. He was, he, I, I remember when he was like making fun of the Austrian social Democrats because they used to always call each other doctor, you know. <laughs> It's like, oh, you are real revolutionaries because you're so bougie with your academic degrees and stuff. Well, if you're a Leninist and you think that the only the third one matters and you have a hard time explaining why Lenin actually um, called for the sociological study of classes and cultures to figure out how they worked. I mean, Gramsci didn't come out of nothing. And mm -hmm. this is explicit in um, Bertrand Test. It's also explicit in early... Um, Frankly, the Social Democrats, when they were still revolutionary, were also really bad about flipping between notions of class. And also, by flipping between notions of class, flipping between aggregate and individual determinism and, fl and flipping between um, voluntarism and determinism in general in ways that are fucking incoherent. And very few people have tried to reconcile this or call it out. And they hide behind. And frankly, it's hiding. It's, it is it is um, it is basically it is a sub religious form of thinking. It is not even religious, um, <laughs> um, as in it doesn't have the virtues of being religious. But exactly it apes the, the poor but reasoning. But it apes the core reasoning, where you don't want to deal with things by focusing on one thing, by which you actually also in your writings and advocacy don't really focus on. So. On that sense, yeah, it is true that only the last one matters for why capitalism is the mode of production, which it is. Okay, good luck. You haven't done shit with that in 200 years. Grow up. Like, well, I don't even think you can understand like the Spetsy and you know whole portions of the Russian Revolution if you don't understand opportunity hoarding. Like, Well, I would look at it. I feel like that the, the real core of capitalism is the Marxist approach, which that he really emphasizes... But like, even if you read the premier, it's not like Marx just talks about one class and another class. He's implicitly saying there is like stratification and opportunity hoarding for me is just like an adjunct of exploitation or something. You know, it's it's not the main dynamic. But I think there is like these three sections, I think, are required to fully talk about class in capitalism. That's the way I look at it. You know, but if I was to say which is the most important driving one, you would have to say it's the Marxist relation in production. Does anybody argue with that? No. Uh, or, or is, that the general, it, it, is that what it's people in, think? It's interesting that he kind of uh, will get on to argue that the Marxist case is kind of a special case of the Viberian one. But uh, yeah, other than that, uh, I totally agree. So yeah. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to harp more on this, uh, you know, owning the means of production is the ultimate opportunity hoarding because <laughs> it opens you up to the job of being able to <laughs> employ others. Well, let's go on with this because I do think, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, he, he's right about this. And I think he's actually, to me, critiquing classical barbarianism, but we can get stuck in this because like, particularly Ezra and I have read this text Ezra, you've had me read it three times. Uh, really? Have yeah. I? Did I do that to you, Derek? Well, I mean, I've, I've only read it three times. Derek, do you have uh, Ezra's real world address, and we can get Puya to make, make a bomb <laughs> and get him go Ted Kaczynski style on her? Jeez, oh, I'm not um, that important. So basically, what what we're saying here essentially is that. What we're trying to do in this reading group, or maybe what Eric Golden Wright is doing, is the kind of equivalent what Marx was trying to do with value theory and to disambiguate the word value into its component parts. Sound, does that sound bullshit? No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I guess the, a theory of surplus value would be the thing that you're referring to, more or less. No, but the mixture between like value and use value and all that kind of stuff and how the language itself caused a lot of confusion. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I mean, Mark seizes on the fact that there is a distinction of use value in Adam Smith, for example, and whatever value is. But value, surplus value, abstract labor, those are not disambiguated in classical political economy at all. And then in neoclassical political economy, they just avoid the fuck out of them. I mean, all of them, really. Like, it's not just it's not just value. They avoid they avoid like they avoid talking about labor. They avoid talking about um, uh, basically everything Surplus. becomes about the market dynamics and not anything about the production um, of commodities at all. Okay, let's move it on. The final little bit in the preface then is about this idea of the game metaphor. Ezri, do you want to take this slide? Yeah, this is uh, borrowed from. This is borrowed from another author that makes a similar like a similar distinction in a political science context. And basically, in order to talk about the, these three aspects of class, it's useful to think of them as like three aspects of a game. You have the systemic level, which is about what game to play, capitalism or socialism. You know, what happens to the surplus? Is there a surplus extraction process? Whatever. I think on the left, like on the, you know, oh, we're very serious uh, socialists, Marxist left. We actually spend most of our time talking about the institutional level, which is conflict over rules of the game. You know, what type of capitalism are we going to do? Uh, you know, that's the opportunity hoarding level. And then the situational level, the sort of, individual sort of intersectional like aspect of class or whatever, like the, the lived experience of class is conflict over the moves of the game. You know, what individuals will do to navigate and play the game. So I feel like I should have put pictures beside each one. The top one at the systemic level, we could have had a picture of Bernie, right? Then the <laughs> yeah. yeah, he wants to completely transform the rules okay. of the game. Yeah. And the institutional yeah, okay. level, we'd have a picture of Elizabeth Warren, okay? Oh, and then geez. at the situational level down at the bottom, we might have Pete Buttigieg. And that would be our, <laughs> that's how we'd break it up. What do you reckon? Oh, God. I mean, I think that there's something... dated and wrong. <laughs> I was about to say, it's like, that may have been true a few months ago. But I, I do think... This, of all the things we got into, um, clarified my thinking. I've been ranting about how people didn't understand sectional class analysis, and they would go back and forth between like false consciousness and what. But I'm like, is false consciousness your immediate interest or your long term interest? You're not actually clarifying this at all. Um, and this really does. And so weirdly if you look at what we just i mean this may be a function i think it's a function of both the powerpoint no it fits to you tom but also the way it came in the book if you look at the way the three the stratification the viberian and the marxist this almost flips it so the systemic is the marxist level like uh, yeah. yeah yeah so i i probably just it's probably just order in the book they were right and the institutional level is the Weberian opportunity capture that deals with credentialing, skills. It deals with a lot of stuff, actually, that Marxists tend to not want to talk about. And then we have um, the situational level, which is like stratification. Someone is poorer than me. Someone is richer than me. Someone has um, uh, racial or gender privilege that I don't have, et cetera, and so forth. And this book actually was one of the books that got me thinking about stuff like what if we had a materialist intersectionality instead of just leaving it up to weird like standpoint epistemologists? Because, because if we use this, this is an intersectional multi-layer theory in which you can plug in non-economic factors into class analysis yeah. without becoming a, a namby-pamby bourgeois liberal or pretending that intersectionality as a base concept now it does now but as in its original instantiation was somehow like a plot to destroy marxism i mean i've seen smart people who are not class reductionists even say this shit like it's actually a function of bourgeois law but we could use the analytic framework in pairing with something like this because even intersectional like oh let's include class race and gender together that isn't going to explain very much honestly you need a much more robust and multi-layered view 
of class between race, class within race, what's the institutional experience, what is the systemic experience, how do you deal with it on your daily life, how does this change, when, I mean, like, if you're talking about this and ignoring all those questions, to most people, you sound like a weirdo. You know, it's funny that you should say that this is um, a perfect basis for talking about, like, gender class or, like, race class kind of stuff. Like, you know, the class aspects of those things and, like, the ways that Marxists want to talk about them but can't because they keep conflating it with, like, the fundamental, you know, fundamental mechanisms or something. Um, Eric Olin Wright himself is a, what you would, might call a multi-systems theorist, you know, thinking of class and, you know, gender as distinct uh, systems where, yeah, I see the same potential where it's like, oh, yeah, this is a good way of getting to like, you know, I don't know, like sexed aspects of class or something. Whereas that's totally not where he goes with it at all. <laughs> Although he would appreciate the analogy made of a sort of emancipatory, I don't know, logical structure of a social science, you know, kind of being copy pasta onto another topic. He has a whole book where he does a sort of analogical feminist analysis that again, he stresses is different than class analysis, but can kind of take on a lot of the same, like a lot of the same, like long-term structural logics or something. Right. So, yeah. I mean, to me, this is part of what I get to when I talk about how like class reductionists aren't actually class reductionist enough because they aren't reducing things down to their various levels. They aren't looking at the way that they actually are experienced in daily life. They're not looking at class in a, in a lens that reduces class to anything other than a kind of cultural or social understanding of what class is, which, which I'm not against cultural social understanding of class. I actually think one thing that this book um, actually sorely lacks is incorporating Pierre Bardieu and distinction and and um, cultural capital as a kind of opportunity capture for access to real capital. And that's one of the only flaws I see in it because he doesn't he it's kind of included in the Weberian framework, but it's not really. What Marx never thought about is clout. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, kind of actually. I mean, Bourdieu, that that is Pierre Bourdieu's sole critique of Marx. Is Marx didn't talk about the way clout could be used to limit access and class mobility, and also to reinforce class um, class not just stratification, but access to production, access to skills of production, etc. Like, there's so many ways in which taste is a code that gets you into educational modes which can give you access to skills that can literally change your ability to run a business or whatever. Like it changes your access to real capital. And again, like I think something like this enables us to put that in there. And if you put distinction in there, you then have to talk about things like race and gender because those are also key points of that. Like there's no way out of it. And you can put all this in a class rubric without saying that race and class are the same thing because they're not. Um, okay. and not get into this whole like pissing max between race reduction and class reduction, which is frankly not just a waste of time. It's a very mm -hmm. shitty way to understand the world. Like you're not going to be able to explain inter intra-racial dynamics that way. You're not going to be able to explain weird, weird stuff that like basic liberal sociologists talk about better than we do. Like one of the examples is like, um, it's like, Pew stratification sociologists talk about how the intensification of the feeling of racism happens in the upper middle of the strata. Um, so like as other forms of uh, dominion oppression and even class stratification leave, race becomes the primary barrier. All right. Now, a Pew study can talk about that. Why can't Marxists? Yeah, I, was, I pretty much had the same thoughts about that move that you could make with this framework uh, when I was reading this first chapter. I was like, oh, hey, this is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, he has a whole category of literature that he calls emancipatory social science, which I think is like a good way to kind of frame a lot of, you know, cultural Marxism, you know, like, and what they genuinely do have in common. At the basis of it is a theory of social reproduction, which betrays his 
you know, sort of structuralist Marxist roots, but in a good way, like people losing faith in, in the whole forces of production story and emphasizing relation to production, thinking about where those relations to production come from is probably one of the like least insidious things about the whole Althusserian Marxist legacy, because it allows for, not that all the literature is great, but stuff like social reproduction feminism that is trying to do, you know, which I think something like Eric Olin Wright gives you the tools for better than, you know, a lot of Althusserian theory um, and structuralist, post-structuralist theory. Like it allows you to talk about all kinds of problems, really. It is abstractable. Right. And you can model it. Uh, I actually think what long-term interests are ultimately going to be expressed in the systemic level, but the others play out at all the other levels. So like your situational interest, for example, if a boss plays, plays, um, if you're in a job and, and sometimes Richard Wolf will get vulgar about this and make really dumb statements. But if you're in a job, for example, where it seems to you like you're turned down for a promotion because of, um, you don't play golf. Hiring. Yeah. Don't play golf. You yeah. don't, uh, but preferential hiring or because you don't play golf, either one, actually, they can lead to you bringing out some other institutional and systemic cultural biases in ways that encourages, frankly, racism or sexism or any number of isms, actually. Now, but there's also a way in which the short term interest, like my short term interest as a teacher is not always going to be in the same immediate interest as a short term interest of a factory worker. My short term interest as a worker in a city is not going to be in the same interest as a worker in a coal plant in the short term. It's just not because I want my air to be cleaner and they need that job. And in fact, your own short term interest, depending on like in your different places in the sections of capital, can be in conflict with themselves within you as an individual. And um, that's very much at the situational institutional level. When we talk a lot about barriers to understanding systemic politics, we actually often get stuck in that muck. And we are like, well, you just have to give up capitalism. And people are like, well, OK, but how are you going to do that? And until you do that, I have to deal with my immediate needs, which means I got to eat. And this was a problem that even someone like Kowski recognized and Sorrell, too, actually I know we keep on tying it back to those people, but it really it, they they saw like okay the general strike will you know will actually play out in a way where the short term interest or the situational level interest of most of the proletariat will cause them to cave unless you could already have enough power to take the state anyway. In which case, why don't you just do that? I think the situation on the institutional levels, unfortunately, completely dominate most of the time. The times when the systemic level comes into play, you know, in capitalism history has been three or four times in history that the that the game has come into play. Most of the time it's like, oh, God, I'd like two extra dollars an hour in my job, you know, or I, I'm going to move jobs so I can get to have a different job where my boss is not so much of an asshole. Yeah, I, I hate to say it this way, but scientifically that's sort of appropriate, right? Like, if, a, if you have a stable mode of production or a relatively stable mode of production, you know, going from one historical epoch to the next is an, it's like a huge breakaway transcendent moment in a, in a sense, you know, like I don't want to be too dramatic about it, but like it doesn't happen very often. So most of most people's lives are spent on the situational level and at best winning some change at the institutional level. And even the idea of uh, institutional change relating to the situational at all is, you know, <laughs> most of us probably have wanted to see something like that in our lifetimes and have gotten to thinking about the systemic level because of how often that's frustrated. And so, yeah, conf uh, I, I conflated short term with situational interests, which isn't exactly so, because, you know, you could um, think of situational interests and, you know, conflict over moves in the game in a number of ways on an individual level, or if you're forming a labor union, you want to outflank your boss and, you know, you can't change the Taft-Hartley Act. So, you know, you could have like a more far seeing kind of solidaristic union rationality on the situational level, you know? So 
yeah, it's not strict on the short term medium thing, but I think what I wanted to emphasize is that the systemic level is long term. Uh, I did have one point to bring up about that, which is where that point about the Marxist definition kind of being a special case of their Weberian one uh, sort of uh, ends up flipping these a little bit or confusing them. Uh, and that is the point of the capital strike. Because the systemic level, that, as you said, doesn't come up that often. But when a capital strike figures into people's everyday lives and struggles, uh, it is actually immediately relevant, right? Like where ownership, private ownership of the means of production is the last word in a localized social struggle that wins things for capital. And oftentimes it's like, yeah, we can't address the systemic level. Like that's just way out of our reach. But that is the immediate thing that's actually causing us to lose. It's like, well, the, the, the bosses are just going to walk us out or the capitalists are just going to uh, torpedo our economy because we're being too politically uh, disruptive. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at this now and I'm thinking like, you know, systemic level, you know, that's doesn't happen many times. You fall in love, doesn't happen many times in your life. Then you got the institutional level is kind of like you start chatting somebody up in a bar or something. And then the situational level is knocking one out to Pornhub. This is what we're talking about here. <laughs> yeah, that's what we meant by an Okay, Okay, Tom, okay. okay yeah. Tom. <laughs> I'm on fire. I'm on fire tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, Marcus Antonius in the chat says it seems to be, it seems to me that this is a matter of finding balance between individualism and collectivism, i.e. finding a, a balance uh, between short-term gains and fighting for a broader revolution. It, it would seem to me, though, that you can apply collective uh, action to these three levels. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't think it's like an individual collectivist thing. You know, what, it's is, what is craft unionism, right? Exactly. Yeah. I would actually go on and make a big thing because the analytical Marxists, as boring as they are, are really big. Um, on pointing out that there's a difference between aggregate, collective, and individual. You could actually take collective action that is good for the collective and bad for every individual within it. So at the systemic level, it looks like it would be mat matter. But at the institutional and situational level, it could, it could actually be really damaging to the point that it eventually collapses the systemic level change. Ah, we have revolutionary models for this happening. Um, where so you can actually have like we tend to think of this as a binary um when even in marx if you read the german he doesn't talk that way like he a lot of times what we translate as collective is a german word closer to aggregate and it's kind of a mess when we talk about individual versus um collective action because in some ways that binary is never true like there is never a time where it is in your interest to act solely collectively. And it, there's never a time where you can completely act individualistically. It's just, it just doesn't actually occur. And if that is a mythos in capitalism, then we should not give credence to that way of talking. And the, one of the things I'll give the analytical Marxists, is they're very strict on stuff like this in ways that other Marxists just aren't because they don't like being disciplined with words. One of the best... Um examples, I guess. I'm not so sure about uh, collective interests that are bad for every individual. There are probably rules for that, unless we're talking about extreme emergent phenomena or something. Like, uh, I don't Karowski's know. Karowski's work on social democracy is based on some of the ideas of collective interest being bad for almost all individuals. within. The <laughs> yeah, uh, that is something that's strange cajolity to me, but, you know, not outside the realm of, you know, analytical Marxism or whatever. But to speak to your point, one of the best things that talks about like altruism versus, you know, acting selfishly in the analytical Marxist kind of umbrella, I guess, because they're ex-Marxist, is uh, Bowles and Gintis' work on human nature. Samuel Bowles and uh, Herbert Gintis, they go through this whole book called A Cooperative Species and basically develop a definition of altruism that's like, no, it can't just be good for you. It actually has to like sacrifice something and then like, 
then they proceed to kind of show that people are still altruistic if you define it in this like really limited way. Anyway, I don't know. I guess it's not exactly to your point, but it does point out that the analytical Marxists are very like strict about this in a way that we could afford to be. Frankly, in a way that's not like that. <laughs> it's not that electric to talk about on the internet, but like, you know, it can help us have a better conversation. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Gestures, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar.